Good morning. Ooh. Where's my seatbelt gone? How are you? Not I've spoken to you for a couple of days. Let's get the old wing mirrors out. These narrow country lanes, especially if you're driving back after dark, you have to tuck your wing mirrors in while you're driving along. So you don't really need them much, but uh, it just increases your clearance from all the other lunatics driving the other way far too fast. Yeah, so I hope you're well. It's a lovely sunny day in paradise. It's uh, we're in October now. So you're like we're in October now. This car, I'm sure the BDA is in control of this car because it's trying to sabotage me at every turn. What with the radio and the blower and all the beeping and everything. Anyway, I'll be back in my trusty Peugeot next week. This is angry, he's back from Canada. So uh, I'll have to give her back the posh car. Bit of a shame, but never mind. So my financial year finished on uh, Saturday. So I'm pleased to say it was another disastrous year. I'm following the Starbucks uh, tax plan. And uh, what with the uh, loss we carried forward from last year and the fact that we're probably going to break even this year, I don't think the tax man will be bothering me for a while yet. Which is all right by me. So uh, what else? Oh, there's been a couple of stories in the in the news. One, uh, the British Dental Association saying that 58% of uh, dentists are going to, you know, leave the National Health Service in the next year or two, or something along those lines. You know, they're always the same. These surveys. <coughs> Excuse me. They're um, they sort of they do them from time to time, you know, or it's the same survey that they do from time to time, and it's. Blimey, I mean, that's a bit bright. And uh, they always show the same thing, except that they always are slightly worse. So, in other words, they you know, like started off with 20% saying that they were going to resign, and they said that that was shocking. And then 25% next year said they were going to resign, and then that's that's really shocking. And then, and then they were up to about 58 or 52 or something, like more than half anyway, more than half say they're going to leave. Which, I mean, it just begs the question, why haven't they left? <laughs> you, know, you know that old saying, if you're going to punch someone, you don't tell them you're going to punch them, you just do it. So, anyway, the BDA is making a big song and dance about this survey and saying it's the end of Western civilization, or the, the end of dentistry in Western civilization as we know it. And... Uh, and I can tell you what sort of impact this is going to have. Absolutely zero. Absolutely zero. But the uh, the fact that they do it, I think, leads me to suspect that they think it might have an impact, and that you know that they're doing it for a reason. That it's going to have a there'll be an outcome, a result. But the result is it is just gets ignored. And as John Reid, who was the Secretary of State for Health, once said in a press conference I was at. You know, you're, you're, um, I expect you to say that. You're the dental profession. You know, you're, you're lobbying on behalf of the dental profession. So I'm not going to take any notice of anything you say because you're obviously an interest group, special interest group. You're highly conflicted and therefore I can't trust anything you say. And which is a very effective technique, you know, because, I mean, basically it completely pulls the rug out from underneath your negotiating position unless you, uh, you meet the sort of that sort of approach with an equally forceful approach back. Um, but anyway, he was a, he was useless anyway. So I don't know why. You know, he was like a John Reed was a sort of the Labour Party's boxer dog. They used to send in, you know, the the bulldog. They used to send in to just tear someone to shreds. Whoever, whatever, <laughs> however good their argument was, Reed just used to, you know, he was a troubleshooter. And in his later part of his political career, as things got worse and worse for the Labour Party, he was called upon to do more and more uh, troubleshooting and, and uh, problem solving and, and, and eventually the whole thing imploded. Um, but he was good at what he did, which was just pouring foam on fire, whether or not the fire was justified or not. 
So um, anyway, I mean, there is obviously, you know, people like me, the baby boomers, we will be retiring soon. It is a population bulge. You know, everyone knows they got the demographics wrong. These uh, these guys who uh, do the stats, you know, crunch the stats for the government, the uh, analysts got everything wrong. They got the population wrong, they got immigration wrong, they got pensions wrong, they got interest rates wrong and that's why we're in the mess we're in because nobody's planned for anything because they, they plan for pretty much more of the same which is what everybody predicts when they don't know what they're doing and uh, they got very much less of the same. I had a guy in the other day who was a statistics cruncher and I said to him, you know, all this the financial problems, the 2008 crash and everything. I said, don't you think it was your profession has something to, somewhat of the blame attached to them for failing to, you know, do what you said you can do, which is uh, make make uh, evidence-based decisions, decisions based on stats. And and he said to me, uh, he said, you know what? He said, I've never really sort of had it put to me like that before. You know, no one's ever really mentioned that. And I, and I thought, are you taking the piss? <laughs> it's like when someone tells you a dental joke and you go, ha, 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 yeah, no, I haven't heard that a thousand times. But I, he, I think he was actually genuine. I think no one had actually genuinely cut, put, put <laughs> to, to use a, to use a, a sort of a, 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 um, a phrase that he would understand had put two and two together and made four and said that a lot of uh, what's you know gone wrong with the world is due to forecast failures in forecasting. So anyway, um, so the the baby boomers are going to retire, and certainly there will be. Uh, I think there'll be a massive outflow of the profession, of the older sort of more experienced, and by experienced I mean experienced in the UK market. Um, practitioners you know the guys like myself who who qualified in 81 and sort of worked on the NHS for 20 years or, or 19 years anyway and then um, you know really knew know what dentistry in this country could be like you know from the days when we had like 14,000 dentists on the register and anyone could get NHS dental treatment and checkups were all free and every dentist was was making a good living and was very happy working on the NHS. You know that old the, the Halcyon days, Halcyon days that uh, uh, were ruined, were wrecked when uh, by the when Richmond House decided to sort of step in and take over from the the uh, Dental Estimates Board and the um, the uh, General Dental Services Committee uh, and thought they knew better and they could micromanage everything and they micromanaged it into. A, into a steaming pile of shit. <laughs> <coughs> so, so don't expect anything. You know, I mean, from this survey, nothing will happen. And uh, because for two things, first of all, the government never takes any notice of surveys because the survey is not a tool of political power. It's not doesn't pull any levers, doesn't push any buttons. You can just you can shred a survey. Do you know what I mean? And get on with the rest of the day. Uh, and the other thing is. Um, they won't leave. They won't leave. It's fun thing. It's one thing to complain about the NHS and say that you're going to leave, and totally other one to leave. And there have been many, many attempts to um, uh, either persuade dentists to leave en masse or to persuade the government that dentists are going to leave en masse, and neither of them has ever worked because they don't. You know, there's no. My personal opinion is that there's almost no lower boundary to the quality of NHS work. We thought that there would be like a line in the sand that most dentists would say, look, I'm sorry, I, I wasn't trained to do it this way. Uh, I, this far and no further, you know, I won't go any worse than this. This is, I'm not going to put, I am not going to fill teeth with bubble gum. Um, and, um, and I, but I think history, sort of recent history, the last 10, 15 years has shown us that there is no, there's no limit, there's no uh, minimum standard, and the, the abolition of the dental reference officers, you know, was designed to 
avoid them them showing up the fact that there was no minimum standard and the the fact that the GDC was left in charge of uh, standards you know in, in a body that can only really sort of look at the most heinous of negligence and not not at all about whether every crown that's done ends up damaging the contact point on the tooth next door is, is now you know the arbiter of quality and you've got dentists um, who you know and the, and the Department of Health attitude is I don't care what you want to get paid I can always find a dentist who'll do it cheaper I can always find a dentist and they can they can always find a dentist who'll do it cheaper and as a dentist, you know, if you as you talk dentist to dentist and you say to people, but you know, but don't you agree that it should take at least I don't know 20 minutes to do a molar endo? And you will always find someone who says, no, actually, I could I could probably improve on that. You know, I could probably do it cheaper than that. I could probably do it in less time than that. And even if they and it, and it's sort of gone off the radar now because we used to talk about these things and now you don't now you don't talk. Now, now dentists don't say how they achieve what they achieve. You know, if you say, if you say to an NHS dentist, how do you do X number of UDAs a year, or how do you see 30 patients a day and still uh, maintain a sort of a reasonable quality of work, they won't talk to you. They won't because they don't. You know, they don't. They they do things that they want kept secret. Now they won't admit not to the regulator, not to the Department of Health, and now not even to their colleagues, uh, except that, you know, uh, possibly amongst the sort of a, the small clique of people who are agreed that um, the patients aren't entitled to uh, see a hygienist on the scale, on the National Health Service, or patients aren't, aren't entitled to complicated endo on the NHS, they're not entitled to cobalt chromes on the NHS, whereas in fact they are entitled to all three of those things. But there's this sort of this subculture that, uh, uh, you know, that says, well, there are too many roundabouts, you know, not enough swings. So we're going to have to, we're going to have to quietly drop some of the roundabouts and just quietly try and boost the swings. Yeah, <sighs> it's a, it's a difficult problem, and I don't know where it ends, you know. It spirals down, it spirals down until it breaks down. That's what it boils, you know. I mean, that's why everything like that does. It's sort of, uh, I, I've mentioned this analogy before, but Ken said it's like the farmer who had a horse who decided to save money by for every day feeding it a bit less, which was a strategy that worked really well until the horse died. But I've, I've spent my entire career waiting for the NHS horse to die, and it won't die. <laughs> it won't die. It just gets thinner. <laughs> thinner and thinner and thinner and then it's got three legs and then someone cuts off its tail and uses it for a, a, you know to make pillows and then <laughs> and eventually it'll be in the glue factory it's like black beauty and it'll be turned into glue and the department of health is still saying well it's nhs glue don't you worry you know everything's fine <laughs> but it's sad and i do find it very sad and knowing the system i came into and the system i'm leaving behind it's, uh, it is very sad because it was a lovely system and it was a public system and it worked really well it produced very high quality the, the, the quality of NHS dentistry in the early 80s matched any private dentistry now and uh, it, it was it really was done to the best of our ability and using decent quality materials and we had enough time and patients were very happy and it could have been it could have been improved upon I mean it could have done slightly less uh, you know, it was a it was a, a high volume restorative repeat restorative regime, but it, that could have been changed. It should have been tweaked. You know, they shouldn't have gone from 70 miles an hour forward to uh, 70 miles an hour reverse. Do you want to get out? No, you don't want to get out. All right, fine. Let's just stay there. That's fine. Okay. And the other story was. Uh, uh, patients losing dentures in hospital and how it's a uh, uh, insult and an abomination to their dignity and how many of them die before the dentures can be replaced because the dentures take so long to replace so it's not like losing their hearing aid or their glasses um, I mean the, the biggest problem in hospital is the patients losing their bloody jewellery 
I mean, the number of patients. There are there are a lot of thieves. I don't. I really hope the NHS starts doing some bait, bait and trap uh, techniques for patients. You know, who leave their because everyone goes into hospital or, or the hospice with their their diamond ring on their finger because you know it's sentimental. If you're going to die, you don't want to die stripped of all your dignity and your jewellery. So they take in one piece of jewellery and they don't come out with it. But leaving that aside, you know, all the thieves that are working on the NHS, that is a rather inconvenient fact, you've got um, people losing their dentures. Now how does someone lose their dentures? Right? How does someone who so how does someone who spent their life looking after their dentures and taking them out and putting them back in, how do they suddenly lose their dentures in hospital? It's got to be third party interference, right? I mean I know okay there'll be a few people with dementia that'll lose their dentures. But basically, it'll be, it's the nursing staff or the catering staff. One of them, one or the other is throwing them away. And I think, on balance, it's the nursing staff. And I'll tell you why. Because I've had to make a, had to make a, I made a set of dentures for a patient who lost their dentures in hospital. And what had happened was the nurse had thrown them away. And now, there is an obligation when the patient is incapacitated, like in hospital, for the nursing staff to care for them and they are obligated to care for them dentally. Now, dental care for, the, for someone else is something that nobody wants to do. And NICE can tussle with it as much as they like and they won't solve the problem that it's absolutely disgusting to have to clean somebody else's false teeth. So what happens when someone is in hospital inadvertently with a disgusting old set of dentures because don't forget, as dentists, we tend to see the nicer ones. But we're discussing an old set of dentures that's been in their mouth for years and is all slimy and they what happens is they go in the bin. They go in the bin, I'm telling you. Rather than sit there and clean them or do something about it, the nurses will, it's easier for them just to chuck the bloody dentures away and say, oh dear, what a shame. I don't know where they were on your side table five minutes ago and now they cleaner must have taken them or um, the uh, or someone's you know that the the, the uh, people who could bring you the food they must have wrapped it up you know you wrapped it up in a tissue and put it on your tray and they've taken the tray away and now your dentures are gone and it is a nightmare because you can't get the uh, usually the dentures can't be made before the patient comes out of hospital or dies and uh, and the other, and the problem with that is that the dentist can't make them. They have to be made by the hospital dentist, and that's because of this stupid dichotomy between funding in primary and secondary care. The quickest, the person who's most able and quickest at making replacement dentures would be the general practitioner. But they would rather say to the. And I, ha, I made a set of dentures for a patient who was in hospital, and I was told by the dental estimates board at the time that uh, I couldn't be paid for them because. This patient, just because this patient was lying in the wrong bed. If they'd been in their own bed at home, they would have paid for them. But because they were lying in a hospital bed in the hospital, they wouldn't pay for them. So, all this huffing and puffing about how, uh, you know, the patients are losing their dignity and stuff like that. Not a mention at all of where these dentures are going. And why they're, why they're being lost. And why so much is being lost and stolen. Of these vulnerable people. But they need to come to some sort of arrangement whereby the um, whereby the Richmond House, you know, the, the, the primary primary dental care debits secondary dental care for the cost of the estimated cost of the dentures that are made in hospital, and then they could be made by the patient's practitioner. You know, it may well have the study model still in the cupboard, <laughs> for all you know. You know, we certainly know the, the patient a lot better than the hospital dentist. And it's certainly a far more efficient and, uh, than, than any sort of dental unit in secondary care. Uh, what's the point? I mean, if the patient, you know, it takes, it takes four weeks to make a denture under normal circumstances. I know we do it in a day, but they don't do it in a day. So it takes them four weeks to make a set of dentures. And what, what patient is in hospital for four weeks? And what patient wants to survive without dentures for four weeks? Okay.
Oh, that's better. That's a good bit of parking, that. Right, okay. Well, it's nice to see you again. <clears throat> I'll, um, if there's anything interesting in the news, I'll talk to you tomorrow. All right, bye.